This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thanks so much for, for coming today. Um, uh, a few of the usual um, housekeeping points. Um, please, please make sure your mobile phones are, are turned off. Um, the, uh, the practice fire alarm went off at 9.30 this morning. If it goes <laughs> off again, it's the real thing. Uh, and you should leave um, by, um, by the exit uh, on, my, on my left. Um, and the key thing that I always mention on these occasions is that these beautiful microphones in front of you are purely ornamental. Uh, they are completely useless. Um, so I'm afraid our, our speakers will have to project a little bit and you will have to project uh, when you ask a question. And since we are recording this session, uh, please identify yourselves uh, when you ask a question and please also, because I know there will be an awful lot of interest, uh, keep your questions uh, brief and to the point. Um, welcome to this witness seminar. Uh, called Managing Commonwealth Controversies, Lessons from the Past. We thought it would be lovely to have uh, a specific event just as the 2013 Chogun is beginning, uh, looking at controversies around previous Chogans, how they were managed, what they tell us about the nature of the, of the Commonwealth. Um, this is part of our broader mission at the Institute of Commonwealth History to capture and record the, the history of the Commonwealth. And uh, a key part of this mission is our Commonwealth World History Project, uh, the website of which we will be launching in its preliminary form um, after about a, a year and a bit of, of work uh, at, at the end of uh, this afternoon. Um, but we are, we are honored and delighted to have with us today uh, Sir Shriath Sunny Ramphal. Um, you all know who he is. I don't need to in introduce him. But I always say two things about him on, on, on these occasions. Um, first, he is not simply a former Secretary General of the Commonwealth, um, who, of course, served three consecutive terms from 1975 to 1990. He is simply one of the most significant figures in post-war international relations. And the fact that he is that uh, bears testimony both to the force of his extraordinary personality, but also to the extraordinary things that he did with this organization called the Commonwealth during that, during that time in office. Um, the other thing that I always say to him, and almost the, the, the more important one, is he is a graduate of the University of London. Um, and uh, uh, a graduate specifically of uh, King's College. And, and so it is particularly appropriate uh, that we begin this session with a, a short historical presentation uh, by my colleague Ruth Craggs, who joined the geography department at King's College this, this academic year, but who is also uh, a, a, a co-investigator uh, on our oral history project uh, and a, a great addition to, to the team. So I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Ruth uh, to introduce this session uh, uh, before I ask uh, Sasani to, to speak to us. Ruth. Thank you and um, thank you for all coming to listen. I'm sure you're not here to listen to me really so I'm going to keep my, um, my comments brief. Um, but I thought I should start by saying that I very much enjoy walking past King's College on my way in to the entrance hall and seeing a big picture of Susani um, staring down at me, um, reminding me of the illustrious alumni of the university that I've just joined. Um, so it's something I've very much enjoyed since July. Um, so in keeping with the theme of um, this seminar and this kind of witness seminar, I want to talk about um, Commonwealth controversies at the Chogums, and I'm going to be talking historically, um, not about Sri Lanka, but perhaps some things which I say might prompt us to think about what's going on today as well. And I'm going to be talking about two things, crisis and choreography, and I'll try and explain a little bit more about what I mean by those things um, as, we go, as we go through. And I'm going to talk about Singapore, 
1971, where there was a big crisis over arms to South Africa. Um, and then I'm going to talk about Lusaka 1979, kind of crisis about whether the, the Chogun could go ahead in Lusaka, and about Rhodesia. <coughs> Two very different conferences, one seen very much as a success, one seen, at least at the time, as a bit of a failure. But I want to talk about crisis at both of those, and um, actually seeing both of those in some ways as productive. Um, and I just want to do a quick plug for, um, for the oral history project that we've been working on and which um, Sue's been very much leading on because some of the things that I'm talking about today come from the oral history project and there'll be a few quotes from it but also because I think it gives people a really good chance to actually get behind some of these the things that were going into the cri these crises and the management of them and the choreography of trying to make them into something productive so I would urge you to have a look at it um, if you get the chance. So, Singapore. This was the Singapore Chogum in 1971. And I want to talk briefly about the kind of well-laid well plans that the Singapore government made to make sure this was a very um, good conference and sort of the, the overtaking of that by events around arms to South Africa. So for Singapore, holding a Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, as it still is today, was a really good opportunity. It allowed um, Singapore to put itself on the map as a diplomatic and political actor, and it was quite important for Lee, um, for Lee Kuan Yew um, to have a kind of sec successful chairmanship and to secure his own reputation in international relations. And as well as taking part, place in what was then a very new and modern building, which you can see on the slide, um, Lee demanded that Singapore put on a good show, show. And this is me quoting Derek Ingram, who's sitting in the audience, who's noted that he drilled into people what an honour it was for the country to have so many guests. Buildings had been repainted, flower beds restocked, grass trimmed, taxi drivers told by Mr Lee personally that they must be courteous to visitors. Commonwealth Prime Ministers and Presidents are bound to be impressed by the efficiency and prosperity of Singapore. And when you look through the newspapers in Singapore at the time, you see gripes about the politeness campaign that had been promoted to make sure everyone was polite to new visitors and about the kind of beautification strategies were taking place. People had been told they had to colour wash their properties. All the monsoon canals had been blocked with pot potted plants to make everything look beautiful. So in Singapore, there was very much a push, as there often is in these things, to promote a very a particular positive vision of the country. And the conference allowed Lee to project a modern vision of independent Singapore to the rest of the conference, to the Commonwealth, and himself as an international statesman within that. But even in highly organised and authoritative authoritarian Singapore at that time, with a well-rehearsed script of welcome and a tidy stage, conference performances could not really be disciplined in that way, and the whole thing was overtaken by a crisis. Just as they had in the 1960s, Southern African issues dominated proceedings. The UK government, with Ted Heath newly in charge, was threatening to sell arms to the apartheid regime in South Africa, overturning um, an embargo on arms sales by the Labour um, government that had preceded him. Singapore was Heath's first chogum, and he was to take centre stage, cast as the villain of the piece, the man who wants to sell arms to South Africa. And at the conference, despite the best intentions to make this a story about modern Singapore, it became all about Southern Africa. Eastern Southern African leaders took a strong stance on the arms issue and utilise the conference to perform and to kind of get their message out there. Tanzania, Uganda and Zambia all threatened to boycott the conference or to consider withdrawing from the Commonwealth altogether if Britain went ahead and you can see these things going through history. Once the summit began, whilst official proceedings were slightly long-winded and dry, in the kind of press conferences outside of the conference halls there was a series of ongoing and exciting debates going on. President Kaunda met the world's 
newsman um, in an extraordinary press session on the 16th of January. And the broadcast of this press conference began with Calendar making a statement that it was believed that Zambia had come here to wreck the conference. We had come here with our minds made up to walk out. And the voiceover noted that questions on the sale of arms to South Africa dominated the whole of the news conference. And in the following days, broadcasts were made to the press by Kaunda, Abote, Lee, Heath, and others. And these press conferences allowed that argument over South Africa to really reach a global audience. The, conference, the press conferences themselves were a spectacle, drawing big audiences of journalists, and not only from Commonwealth countries, but also from other state, um, countries like the United States. And I think it's interesting to think of moments of crisis as a time when Commonwealth interests people beyond c the, the Commonwealth itself. <laughs> so I think the press conferences illustrate moments when um, newly independent leaders were able to critique Britain quite vociferously. And in large part to the British press, this star status of these new leaders um, and their abilities to shape the terms of the debate um, was acknowledged. But they were often talked about in quite negative terms. So, for example, this is Nicholas Carroll in the Sunday Times, noting that the Africans, after a quieter start than usual, began to turn the affair into what at times looked like a three-ring all-African circus with the Black Marx Brothers turn in the shape of Presidents Kaunda, Nerere and Abote with their large-scale press conferences and their reception of steady stream of admirers in their hotel suites. So in Britain, these kind of these, these threats and these criticisms were, were seen in quite disparaging terms by some parts of the press. And you get cartoons such as this one, um, which shows an embattled Heath hitting back at African leaders pelting him with objects. Captioned unfair, he's hitting back. The illustration underlines the aggressive, or at what was understood as an aggressive relationship between Heath and the mainly black Commonwealth leaders led by Kawunda of Zambia, who's... Um, in the middle there. And I think we can think all sorts of things about the way in which different people are being presented in the media, and I might return to this um, in the conclusion. So at Singapore, the preparation um, was overshadowed by the choreography and the kind of quite um, important and um, knowing choreography of newly independent leaders, particularly in East and Southern Africa, using the conference to make their point about arms to South Africa. Um, and I think we can see that as something that was quite productive, even if um, in the immediate aftermath things were seen as quite um, problematic at, at Singapore. The second brief program that I want to talk about is that in Lusaka in 1979, and no doubt we'll hear more about that um, from Sir Sonny in a minute. And here, too, there was crisis, controversy, and choreography. In the run-up to the conference, the Commonwealth remained split, with pretty much Britain on one side and most of the rest of the Commonwealth on the other, um, over South Africa, and in the middle of tense negotiations around the future of Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. British Prime Minister, again newly elected Margaret Thatcher, was seen as threatening because she was more friendly towards the white rebel, rebel regime in Rhodesia, and she was also um, seen to be better disposed towards South Africa. She was expected to get a hostile reception when she arrived at the Trogham. Indeed, the D Zambia Daily Mail denounced her a racist on the eve of the conference. And according to her Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary, Peter Carrington, she was so concerned about how she would be greeted that she wanted to don dark glasses when she came off the plane despite arriving at, um, in the evening because she was worried someone was going to throw acid at her. So unlike the other, um, so just like this earlier conference, this was one that was dominated by a kind of feeling of crisis and controversy. But prior to the conference, the Commonwealth Secretariat, led by Sasani, was expending significant time and resources in the effort to create a, um, a welcoming um, conference and a welcoming space for negotiations, particularly relating to making Thatcher um, feel welcome and not feel threatened when she arrived. 
So this involved both the kind of everyday mundane but important things of creating, the making sure the hotels were ready, making sure everything was produced and there and on time, but also producing a welcoming atmosphere. So, so, so Sunny Ramfro makes clear that this was important um, to prepare the psychological attitude and environment for the meeting. And one of the important things within that was to dissipate the fears of Margaret Thatcher. She was a little apprehensive, Sunny said, that she was meeting these African ogres as she would have perceived them. A more comfortable atmosphere was ensured by speaking to Kaunda of Zambia, the conference host, and Julius Nerere of Tanzania to explain, this woman fears that you're going to be very hostile to her, and she's therefore going to come in a very defensive mood, and we've got to dissipate this. And the only way we'll be able to do that is for me to be able to say to her that that's not going to happen, that you want a different kind of dialogue. And here I think you can see the preparations, the choreography that's going on behind the scenes in preparation for a children. The Secretariat also had to deal with a press that, particularly in Britain, wasn't necessarily always on the same side as them. So a month before the conference was due to begin, the Sunday Express carried the front line, front page headline, Mrs Thatcher, my fears for the Queen's safety, kicking off an intense debate about whether Lusaka was indeed actually too dangerous a place for the Queen to go and for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting to take place. And the Secretariat again had to spend, expend lots of effort negotiating um, for a, um, for the, to make the um, venue a safe place with Joshua Nkomo and also issuing and constantly refuting these claims in the press. And I've seen the records in the archive of, you know, how many people are phoning up ask, asking about a change of venue um, in these months running up to it. So during the weekend retreat, retreat once the conference had started, um, a select group of leaders, including Thatcher, Thatcher and, Cal and um, Carrington, Kenneth Kaunda, Julius Nerere, Malcolm Fraser, and Michael Manley of Jamaica, were invited to State House in order to try to make progress um, in the negotiations over Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. And in this, it was very important that Kaunda um, produced a relaxed atmosphere, but it was also important that all the other people were kept out of the way so they couldn't get in the way of these tense negotiations. So, in, in his interview with me, Sasani notes that they had to be, everyone else had to be got out of the way. What I decided with Kaunda is that we were going to send off most of the Prime Ministers to Victoria Falls on a little excursion. In other words, we were getting them out the way. <laughs> <laughs> it was in this informal and limited weekend retreat session that the agreement was reached. And then the Secretary General himself had to deal with a few people who were a bit disgruntled when they realised they'd been sent away whilst this thing was being cooked up. So after consensus was reached, the choreography became more public. From the behind the scenes and private and secret um, choreography that, met, that allowed a, an agreement to take place, things moved public with a dance between Thatcher and Kaunda at a press dinner. Captioned in the Commonwealth Secretariat Archives, President Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia and Mrs. Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, take steps towards closer Ang Anglo-Zambian relations at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. This was a knowing performance that helped to shape press reports of the conference itself. Mrs. Thatcher dancing the tango with President Kaunda, even the veterans were purring, declared the observer in its caption under a reproduction of the photograph. So the dance and the dinner contributed to this overall feeling of excitement in Lusaka and helped in shaping what the press were writing. So one Zambian journalist that I spoke to remembered, we were so excited, it was so exhilarating, because before that conference, Thatcher and Calendar were always quarrelling. So we didn't think that someday these two leaders could sit down together. Just seeing the two together dancing, we knew that things were being resolved. So when they danced, it was a big story. Here's Calendar and Thatcher. Then we knew we were getting somewhere. So this image went round the world. It was published in Zambian, British, other Commonwealth newspapers, Zambian Daily Mail, Times of Zambia, Observer, Daily Express, Time magazine, and many more. And it forms a really 
clear way in which this conference is remembered in autobiographies like Carrington's, for example, creating a more durable political um, image of political agreement. So, in conclusion, and to quote Richard Bourne, who I can see sitting in front of me, um, and this was from his interview taken from the, for the Commonwealth Oral History Project. From time to time, and usually thanks to a crisis, the Commonwealth seems to matter for its member states, and indeed for non-member states too. That was the case, for instance, over South Africa, with the execution of the Agoni, with the departure of Zimbabwe, maybe in Sri Lanka this year. It's usually out of a crisis that the Commonwealth seems suddenly to have some significance. So maybe we can see these crises as having the ability actually to be productive. And in the context of Singapore, um, I've asked how much we can see kind of violent exchanges disagreement as something that could actually be seen as something that was productive. So at Singapore, despite much of the reporting being negative, the choreography of opposition in the press was effective in pressurising the British government crisis choreography at the conference was effectively used. The Commonwealth and its conferences could act as a break on or at least amplify a critical response to one of the member states, Britain, and what it felt it could do. And the Commonwealth provided actors often marginalised in the kind of geopolitical world with quite a loud voice in which to speak. Chogums in the 60s and 70s and 80s contributed to a wider questioning of British policies in southern Africa and the problematisation of popular narratives of Britain and smooth decolonisation and it all being fine. Atmospheres of discord, I think, and disruptions to this neat script could be seen as something um, quite productive. And in my work on Lusaka, I see something a bit different happening. A crisis, for sure, again, but this one managed, stage managed and choreographed in all sorts of ways in order to bring about a negotiation and a constructive solution. So two moments of productive crisis in different ways, but both in a different sort of geopolitical moment, if you like, than the one we have today. This again is from the Commonwealth Oral History Project's um, interviews, and this is Sir Malcolm Rifkind, who says that the Commonwealth's high moment in terms of public awareness of the Commonwealth as a political institution, as an institution that could help change the world in various ways, was during apartheid South Africa when the Commonwealth basically led world opinion in coordinating, initiating and activating, not always the United Kingdom's comfort. And I think you could say the same thing about the earlier period around Rhodesia too, and Zimbabwe. What about today? Are we in the same sort of position today, or are we in a different sort of post-colonial moment than we were? We clearly have a crisis, so that's something that we can say forms a continuity from those earlier conferences I was talking about. But I think we have a slightly different sort of crisis, which is much more difficult for various reasons for the Commonwealth to manage. Partly because the bad guy is not Britain and is therefore much more complex for a post-colonial organisation such as the Commonwealth to deal with. And partly because the actors and the choreographers, both the Commonwealth heads of government and the people in the Commonwealth Secretariat, are a different set of actors and may be less able, <coughs> less desiring to choreograph and manage either a protest or some kind of negotiated and constructive solution. So maybe some things to think about over the next hour, couple of hours. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you.